Welcome, it's your host Tony. For today's episode of Actually Existing Socialism, your favorite podcast dedicated to exploring past, present, and future real world manifestations of socialism, we have on the enlightening Julia Mead. Julia is currently a PhD candidate in modern European history at the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on masculinity and coal mining in state socialist Czechoslovakia. She joined the show today to discuss what has socialism done for women, which is also the title of the article she co authored with Kristen Godsey, published in Catalyst. The article details the advances women made under state socialism as it actually existed in 20th century Eastern Europe, its global impacts on women's rights, and its lasting legacy. We cover a lot of ground in this episode, from 19th century socialist feminism, the experience of trans women and lesbians in the Eastern Bloc, and the story of how Lumila Pavlichenko, famed Soviet sniper, defied Western stereotypes of what it means to be a woman. The article, relevant links, and info regarding Julia's work are freely accessible on the Patreon posting of this episode at patreon.com slash AES the podcast. This show is 100% listener funded, so if you'd like to support the show by contributing as a Patreon subscriber, you'll gain access to a variety of bonus episodes and content. If you're unable to contribute, no worries. You can help out by sharing this episode and other friends, family, and colleagues by following us on Twitter at AES the podcast. But most importantly, you can help out by engaging in local worker struggles, whatever form that may be. Before we get to our discussion with Julia, first a reading by Kristen Godsey of What Has the October Revolution Done for Women of the West, written in 1927 by Alexandra Kollontai, a prominent Bolshevik Party member and feminist activist. What the October Revolution has achieved in terms of the emancipation of working women in the Soviet Union is well known to all, is clear and indisputable. However, What effect has the Great October Revolution had on the movement for the emancipation of women in other bourgeois countries abroad? What has it contributed to the creation of the new woman involved in the tasks and aspirations of the working class? World War, which in Europe and North America drew enormous numbers of women from the poorer sections of the population and those with moderate means into the whirlpool of production and state administration, undoubtedly served to advance considerably the cause of female emancipation. The rapid growth of female labor brought with it unparalleled changes in family life and in the overall mode of life of women in bourgeois countries. However, this process of female emancipation would scarcely have advanced any further without the powerful example of the October Revolution. From the very first days of the October Revolution, it became clear that women's energies are needed not only by the husband and the family, as has been thought for thousands of years, but also by society, the whole social collective, the state. However, that this phenomenon is an inevitable historical fact, that the formation of a new type of woman is linked to a general shift towards the creation of a new working society, is something that the bourgeoisie cannot and does not wish to recognize. If it were not for the October Revolution, it would still be generally believed that the woman earning her own living is a temporary phenomenon, and that woman's place is in the family, standing at the back of her husband, breadwinner. This radical change in the evaluation of the tasks and vocation of women in the Soviet Union has affected the attitude to women far beyond the borders of the Soviet Union. We can now meet the new woman everywhere, in every corner of the world. The new woman is a mass phenomenon, with the exception, perhaps, of women in the semi-colonial and colonial countries, where the development of the productive forces is impeded by the predatory rule of the imperialists. However, even there, given the struggle for national self-determination and against imperialism, the new woman is being molded in the very process of struggle. It is impossible to succeed in the struggle between social groups and classes without the cooperation of women. Women are involved in politics, and once again, if war drew large numbers of women into the political struggle, it was only the October Revolution which recognized publicly, by its laws, by the entire practice of the new Soviet system, that once the woman is working in and for society, she should be recognized as an active citizen. The enormous shift in the position of women in the Soviet Union has encouraged contending social groups to attempt to draw women onto their side. 
everywhere, in every country, the political activity of women has shown unprecedented growth over the last 10 years. Would this have been possible without the Great October Revolution? Could the new woman citizen and socially useful worker have emerged without the great whirlwind that blew across the world? Could the working women of other countries have taken such giant strides towards their own comprehensive emancipation without the October Revolution? Anyone who pauses to think realizes that the answer is clearly no. Thanks so much, Julia, for joining us today. Thanks. I'm so glad to be here. So, Julia, a large part of your historical work centers on gender, sexuality, and labor in 20th century Eastern Europe. What drew you to this field of study? Well, it started when I was in college, and I got really lucky to have some courses with Kristen Godsey, who's kind of a leader in this field. And, you know, I was a gender studies major, but it wasn't until I started studying this region and the history of state socialism in particular that I began to think of gender as rooted in political economy and gender discrimination as something that was rooted in political economy and not just individual prejudices. That's what I found really exciting about it initially. Why Eastern Europe or in particular 20th century Eastern Europe? Yeah, well, there are a lot of different ways you could get into this field. And I specifically studied the history of state socialist Czechoslovakia, and it had some of the most profound political changes of anywhere as rapidly as possible. So there are four distinct political regimes in Czechoslovakia in the 20th century. So for a historian, that rapidity of change is really exciting. But it did mean I had to learn Czech, which was hard. (laughs) That's an interesting point about the, the rapid changes, making it the perfect lab, so to speak, in regards to uh, looking at how different political economies have Mm -hmm. impacted women. Absolutely. The late 19th century saw a variety of socialist texts addressing the so-called women's question. August Babel's Women and Socialism, Frederick Engels' The Origin of the Family, Private Property in the State, and Lily Braun's The Women Question. What theoretical and practical ideas did these texts provide to future 20th century Eastern European socialist states that emerged in the 20th century? And how did these ideas differ from the parallel emergent bourgeois style of feminism? This is a great question because a lot of people who study the earliest social feminists don't really, aren't really in conversation with the people who study 20th century. There are three main ideas that these early theorists outlined that later state socialist women's unions and states adopted. The first was the idea that the institution of monogamous marriage existed to preserve private property. Braun and Ingalls and all all these people saw that really the social function of marriage was to make it clear who men's heirs were so that they could pass on inheritances. It really has nothing to do with affection or compatibility or all of these romantic things that we would like to think marriage is based on, but really just in order to ensure inheritance. So it's a constriction of women's sexuality in the surface of capital reproduction. Still, I think, very a very useful insight. And the second big idea that transmitted from these early social feminist thinkers to later ones was that basically they argued for class solidarity over gender solidarity. So they thought that working class men and women had much more in common and and much more to gain from working together for class emancipation than working class women had to gain from working with bourgeois women for something like suffrage or more legal rights. They basically thought that bourgeois women would sell working class women out if they hitched their horse to that carriage. And then the third really big idea was that the state needed to support women as mothers. And this is, I think, the one that the later socialist states were most successful in implementing. They thought that simply child rearing was too big a job for a kind of contained nuclear family and really just one mother to do alone. So things like daycares, canteens and stuff were first conceived of by, by the 19th century socialist feminists. How did that differ at the time from bourgeois style of feminism? So you've outlined kind of three of the aspects of socialist feminism. What was, I guess, even the the dominant, actually, I'm not sure if it was the dominant form of feminism at the time. Could you explain the difference between the two? So bourgeois or liberal style feminism was most concerned with equalizing legal and property rights between men and women. 
So there was very concerned with women being able to keep their inheritance from their fathers when they entered marriage rather than all of that going to the husband. Obviously, this is only a concern if you have a lot of property to begin with. <laughs> so it's very narrow in that sense. And also suffrage. And there were some socialist feminists who were also very invested in getting women the right to vote so that they could vote for socialist candidates. <laughs> but they didn't think that that was in itself sufficient for women's emancipation. What you kind of said reminded me of Helen Keller. I think a lot of people do, do not know that she was a socialist activist operating in the 20th century and is, of course, more known for being the first deaf and blind woman, uh, at least in the U.S., to get a university degree. And I believe her point was exactly what you said, the distinction between wanting to fight for suffrage, not just to vote for the liberal or the conservative party so that women can vote for socialist policies that would impact everyone's life and not just women's. Right. Yeah, Helen Keller is a good example of that socialist style of feminism. Definitely. Yeah, more people should know that she was a socialist. It's very cool. There's a recent documentary that came out called Her Socialist Smile, and it's about Helen Keller's life. It's a very avant-garde experimental documentary, but it's really interesting. I'd recommend checking it out. The early decades of the Soviet Union were incredibly chaotic as they struggled through the after effects of World War I, a brutal civil war that followed World War I. Now they had before them the seemingly impossible task of building the first socialist society without having a blueprint. Despite all these hardships, revolutionary fervor and hope for immediate change was especially high during those first few decades. What are examples of the radical early policies implemented in the Soviet Union regarding women's emancipation, and what were their impacts? It was quite simply a wild time the first few years after the revolution. It's really hard for me, actually, to conceive of the deep and fundamental nature of the change that Bolsheviks were trying to implement in their society. With regards to women, there were two major legislative changes. The first was in 1917, and it replaced church marriage with civil marriage. So this was partly because they were on a path to state atheism and saw the church as standing in the way of the path towards communism. But it was also so that the state could regulate what rights women had in marriage. It basically restricted the claims each partner could make on their property and, and on each other's property during marriage, this civil marriage thing. So it, yeah, it meant that women retained financial or economic independence in theory. And then the second legislative change was the, it's called the Code on, on Marriage, the Family, and Guardianship, which was passed in 1918. The big thing it did was abolish the legal category of illegitimacy for children. So before a child born in wedlock had more legal rights than a child born outside of wedlock. It also outlawed adoption, which is kind of interesting. The idea was that the state could do child rearing better than the nuclear family. It also liberalized the divorce. So that is a really big thing. It, in theory, meant that either partner could leave an unhappy marriage and that women wouldn't be stuck in a kind of difficult or abusive situation. Unfortunately, in practice, it often meant that a man would get a woman pregnant and then effectively abandon her or even marry a woman and, and abandon her. So these were really big changes. And the, the ultimate goal, as expressed by Alexandra Kolontai, who is a, a, a real leader for women's rights in, in the Soviet Union, she was a Bolshevik and she was the first commissar of the, the Commission for State Welfare and the leader of the Genotidel, which was the Soviet Women's Union. The goal with all of these changes was the disintegration of the nuclear family. Bolsheviks thought that child rearing and social life should not happen in individual families, but rather should be done by society in the name of equality and also because this was the vision for the communist future that you know we, we all take care of each other. Unfortunately, this didn't really work out as intended, largely because as you mentioned, there was just profound poverty a decimated agricultural system, a huge housing crisis at, at this time after the revolution in the First World War. I, actually, I looked up this statistic because it, it really shocked me. But in 1922, there were seven and a half million homeless orphans in the Soviet Union. Yeah, there are all these reports of these basically bands of feral children wandering around the streets and terrorizing people. It was a difficult time, and it was a, a very lofty thing attempted by a state that had no capacity. But the kernels of the ideas were tried again in socialist states in Eastern Europe after World War II, which did have a lot more capacity. 
and with more success. So you mentioned the destruction of the nuclear family, which is one of the number one uh, right-wing things to latch on to. And if they read, for example, the Communist Manifesto or any socialist document from the 20th century in particular, can you explain a little more in depth as to what they meant by that? Because it does sound scary from, I guess, from a certain perspective without understanding the concept behind it. Like this critical race theory sounds scary in a similar way to certain people. If you could explain that. Yeah, the phrase the destruction of the nuclear family does have kind of a boogeyman ring to it. I think what's important to understand is that these early socialists saw the institution of the nuclear family as something that really stood in the way of people feeling love and affection and care for each other. That if you're, you know, you spent your whole life constrained legally to someone you marry or you know your parents that was kind of an artificial way to feel human connection the idea was that if there were really a safety net for raising children in a more equal way through daycares and in crashes and this sort of thing and also the kind of freedom to not be locked into a marriage then human relationships would actually be much richer and much more nurturing. So I, I think that there, yeah, there is an idea that this was cruel, that the, the idea of itself is kind of inhuman or, you know, I, I'm picturing something like 1984, you know, everybody's in kind of gray suits and doesn't know how to connect with each other. But really, the idea anyways is rooted in the opposite. Cole and I would always talk about the, the like cold Dickensian capitalist families and how capitalism actually destroys human relationships because everybody wants something from each other and you know people marry for money and put pressure on their children to be a, be an heir and so capitalism destroys human relationships and communism can nourish them. This is the idea. It's very much counter to the 1950s aesthetic of a nuclear family, and this is how everything has to be. But for a, a large period of humanity's history, there was no nuclear family, and that human relations were a lot more communal in that aspect, particularly before the agricultural revolution, 5,000 years or so ago. Rather than it being some kind of you know radical idea, it's in certain aspects, not in, in all, it's a return to an earlier form of conceptualizing a family. You mentioned also um, Alexandra Kollontai. And from what I understand, she was the first cabinet level women to have served in a European government. Yeah. What position did she have? She was the Commissar of Social Welfare. That was her first position. So she was responsible for trying to set up daycares, public laundries, and all of that. Later, she helped run the Genotidel, which was the women's union as part of the government responsible for women's issues. And then I, she ended her career as the ambassador to Norway. Basically, she got on the wrong side of Stalin and he exiled her. Yeah, because she was too committed to the early ideals of Bolshevism. And she remained really invested in, in women's emancipation, even when he tra was trying to institute a return to the nuclear family, basically. She had a long and very interesting life. One more uh, spin-off question from your uh, explanation of these early policies. You expanded on how it was hard to really implement any of these policies because of the mass destruction that occurred during the war. I guess maybe this isn't a question, more of a statement. I always find it like ironic where it's like there's this idea that the Soviet Union had this all-encompassing, all-powerful way to force onto people policies when... <laughs> For a large part of its history, and especially in the, in the more country or remote regions, there was they had very little power to, to do so. And the implementation of these early policies, I think, is an example of that. Yeah, when you start reading actual historical research on the Soviet Union, it becomes so clear that <laughs> the, the discrepancy between decree and reality. There's kind of a historiographic reason for that. Like the earliest histories in English of the Soviet Union were written without access to local archives. So it was scholars just looking at the notes from the Central Committee meeting saying, we are going to do this and this and this and this, because they did, you know, they, they like actually could not access other forms of historical sources. But then really in the 1990s, people started looking at for more bottom up sources. And you just see it all the time. I see it in my work. It's like, well, you know, we tried to go and collect by this farm, but then, you know, the peasants kept 
sleeping in. They wouldn't come to our meetings. Like we just gave up. (laughs) People are always people. They're never too pliable, I guess. Like you said, they weren't 1984, all gray suits and just following in lockstep with whatever came from the center. Exactly. I wanted to ask you about abortion. Was that one of the early policies implemented? Yeah, the Soviet Union was the first country in Europe to legalize abortion, and that was in 1920. I find it from a feminist perspective a little bit complicated. I think it is, of course, good that abortion was legal and really radical. It was a really radical thing to do, but it was largely because of these bands of orphans and that there were more children than anybody knew how to take care of. So it was one way of trying to control that problem. So it's a complicated story, but I think a really important one and ultimately good for women. So you're saying the rhetoric used to promote the idea wasn't so much my body, my choice, or uh, from a, a reproductive rights standpoint. On one hand, there, there were probably fe- social feminist theorists promoting this idea but it was advantageous to the to the state too. Yeah, I mean, the idea of bodily autonomy as like a feminist thing really comes around from the United States and Western Europe in, in second wave feminism in the 1970s. All of these people had a really different idea of what women's emancipation looked like. Independence was part of it, but also they tended to think much more in terms of social problems and collective problems than individual rights. It was really about population control. And then later when it was outlawed, Stalin outlawed abortion in 1936, I think, it was really about population growth. And of course, both of these decisions impacted the life choices of women, the sort of control that they had over their bodies. But from a political discourse level, it was much more about overall state population. We've just gone through uh, some of these very radical early policies, but the Soviet Union appears to retreat in certain areas, uh, not in all, in regards to women's emancipation under Stalin. Uh, What remained the same and changed during this era? Well, the big reason for it was Stalin was pushing really hard to industrialize the Soviet economy. So the first five-year plan started in the 1930s, and this was an attempt to push the Soviet Union into modernity. For this to work, the state just needed a much stronger labor force. As we just discussed, this was the reason for restricting abortion. And there was also the sense that, in some ways, the Bolsheviks had gone too far. And there was a lot of backlash, popular backlash, to some of these very radical early policies because of the unintended consequences they had. A lot of the attempts to socialize domestic labor, laundries, canteens, and stuff, those remained sort of, but there was also more of an expectation that women would pick up the, the slack by cooking and cleaning at home. Actually, quite a bit stayed the same, but there wasn't the same push forward to continue towards the withering away of the family. The, in the Stalinist period, people kind of accepted that the family was, was how society would be organized. Karl Marx had the idea that even after a socialist revolution, this new society that's being formed would still have to contend with all of the, the previous cultural norms and ways of organizing society or living or patriarchy and racism and everything like that would still be a factor at play. So that would still be a major conflict to overcome. But with that said, constitutionally or legally, they, they promoted uh, women's emancipation variety of ways. I believe the 1936 Soviet constitution had a lot of unique women's rights that were stipulated in it. And some of the other socialized things are mentioned in that. You know, I I live in Canada and there's nothing like that in our constitutions guaranteeing any of this for for women. So it's still quite shocking to see. Or just for anyone, yeah. Yeah, for anyone. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. But of course, that the period we're discussing from 1924 to 1953, I believe, of course, is very tumultuous for a variety of reasons. The different state repressions, the external forces, World War II, which decimated the country. What impact did socialist feminism and the achievements of women in the USSR and other Eastern Bloc countries have on the West during this period? What was the perception, both positive and negative, and what was the impact? What Cold War implications were there as a result? There was a really strong stereotype, especially in the later Cold War era of socialist women as being not very feminine. There's this commercial for Wendy's and they had these socialist women and they were like dour, 
honestly pretty masculine looking women in gray jumpsuits like walking around and then they I don't know like find a McDonald's hamburger like wow the West is amazing like (laughs) and they become hot I don't know um (laughs) there's this woman Ludmila Pavlochenko who was a sniper in the Soviet army during World War II and she had like 309 confirmed deaths. They called her Lady Death, and yeah, she she killed Nazis. This was her thing. She killed like a ton of Nazis. And then maybe during the war, she did a tour in the United States, like a propaganda tour to drum up U.S. support against the Axis powers. And there's one interview with her, I think it was in the New York Times even, where <laughs> the reporter asked her about her beauty routine in the field. So do you, do you carry your lipstick with you? And she's like, no, I'm killing Nazi. <laughs> like, I, I'm not doing that. And yeah, there's all this writing about how she's so like unfeminine because she doesn't carry lipstick with her on the battlefield. So yeah, so there's this very prevalent idea that women under socialism were in some way not women. But there's an interesting kind of behind the scenes story which was that these state socialist countries really heavily invested in training women in math and science. And to this day, there are really high levels of women in programming and stuff like that in some of the Balkan countries. And I've heard colleagues make arguments that behind the scenes in the Kennedy administration, there was a lot of anxiety about not unlocking the potential of American women in the same way and that the U.S. was going to lose the space race because of this. There were two kind of ways in which this made the West feel very uncomfortable that, that women had rights. The article you co-authored with Kristen Godsey, What a Socialism Ever Done for Women, goes into detail in, in some of those Western perceptions of, of women and their, their reactions uh, to that. I don't know why gray is associated with the Soviet Union so much, but it's like even in TV shows, they'll put like a gray filter on everything or like mm-hmm. they'll make sure they have the bleakest looking buildings possible. Like Chernobyl did that, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah, definitely. And it's funny because when you actually study the material culture of later socialism, it was very colorful. The furniture and clothes and stuff that were manufactured by the states were really sometimes garishly colorful. In the integral squad, you got a lot of oranges, you got a lot of bright greens, you'll see this stuff all the time. I don't, I don't know what that's about. That's definitely a Western perception thing. So you also talked in the article about the Western perception of, of their own women in the sense that there was a specific place that they had and it was not to be seen equally or to do the same things as a man can or, or could do. And so there's very much a lot of anti-communism in regards to the idea that women should have independence, should be able to work the same jobs as men. They definitely, I guess, were attempting to reinforce their own system by making socialist women or communist women look like they weren't women. Yeah, or unattractive or something like this. You mentioned Kennedy invested in women following national security concerns about the Soviet Union's policies towards women. What came to mind was Valentina Tereshkova. So she was the first female cosmonaut to go into space. And so she did this in 1963. The first American uh, woman to go into space was 1983, two decades later. So that kind of shows the gap in... I guess, support for women in a, in a variety of fields. We're not going to get into this for this discussion, but Valentina Tereshkova has a very interesting life, very humble beginnings, like most of the Soviet cosmonauts, as opposed to the American astronauts, most of them who you know came from wealthier backgrounds and very different kind of class and also gender uh, support from the state. But anyways, um, <laughs> kind of getting back to our, our discussion, what were the challenges women faced under state socialism that were unique to their political economy? So the biggest one is something people call the double burden, which basically means that women had to work outside of the home, but were also primarily responsible for child care and domestic labor within the home. Even though there were these attempts to socialize domestic labor, they were only partially successful. Sometimes you hear this called the second shift. You've got like a stay-at-home wife or a stay-at-home mom who just has a lot more hours in the day. There are, you know, I've even seen sources where women talk about being too emancipated. <laughs> like, we're too emancipated. We have to work all the time. This exhaustion. There's an idea that this is 
specific to the political economy and socialism because there was mandatory employment. But to me, it sounds really similar to a lot of the working parents I know in neoliberal capitalism, where the breadwinner homemaker family model is no longer viable because wage collapse, you know, is impossible for most people, most almost all working people to support a family on a single income. It's kind of funny that <laughs> that we're recapitulating the same problem, but with even fewer external resources. That's that was a big a big challenge. One thing that came up a lot in the nineteen nineties was that there were no provisions for, for dealing with sexual harassment and sexual violence in the constitutions of socialist states. It was seen basically as not a real problem for women. And as we were talking about earlier, Marx was right in that social attitudes of people didn't change overnight with the, the change of political and economic systems. There was plenty of interpersonal sexism, I guess we could say, even though women had legal rights and economic rights, there were still things that are unfortunately very common in, in many places in terms of sexual violence and harassment. The social states didn't really have didn't really even try to deal with this. It obviously existed and continues to exist in capitalist states, but because of the the room for grassroots organizing in those states, there was more collective awareness of, of that as a problem at an earlier stage. So I guess as, as a segue into our next question, uh, what ways do women agitate and organize for their interests under state socialism? Yeah, that's a good segue um, because it looks very different than in capitalist countries. You know, we have a a real image of feminist movements as a social movement in the West, in the United States, in Canada, and Western Europe, that, yeah, the feminist, feminism looks like a big group of people, mostly women, walking with banners and stuff like this, and, and art movements and consciousness raising circles. But in, under state socialism, that didn't exist. There was an explicit outline of civil society, so you couldn't have clubs couldn't have official clubs or like recognized clubs that were separate from the state. But that doesn't mean that, that women had no way of advocating for themselves. So the biggest mechanism for this were women's unions, and these existed in every state and were part of the government. There were government agencies that were responsible for the administration of daycare, stuff like this, and for managing maternity leave policies, they did a lot of different things, honestly, and it depended on who was working in them. So there's a collection of recent scholarship on these women's unions that shows how women working in them really were trying to, to milk the state for all they could in the service of women. So it was much more bureaucratic, but also very effective. Learning this really challenged my ideas of what activism could look like, that they could be a really effective mechanism through which to agitate for women's rights. When we started a discussion, you were discussing elements from 19th century socialists, feminists, in regards to believing that the state should intercede or intervene on behalf of women as a normal aspect of its, its functioning. Like you said, we think of women's movements in, say, for example, North America as being these kind of social movements that are not part of the state, like they're, they're from without the state. And so they're in conflict with the state, which doesn't always lead to success in, in many ways, but in many ways it, it has. And so that, that, that's, of course, been, been great. But if those movements could operate within the government in, in some way, kind of like you said, um, it's, it, it really changes how one can view activism or, or how it should operate. Because if the, the state has the ability to actually implement these things, and you actually have an ear in the state rather than trying to like, you know, do the organizing to meet with a representative who probably won't listen to you at all, or to kind of be like, yes, we totally understand your concerns and we'll make sure we'll pass them on kind of thing. Learning about this history does make me appreciate the kind of contemporary socialist organizing, like inside outside mm -hmm. organizing theory, like Alex, uh, I once said Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez <laughs> talks about this a lot the kind of effectiveness of having people, comrades, in the state and also outside of the state, both pushing from within and without. And learning about the effectiveness of women's organizing within the state under socialism in Eastern Europe has really convinced me that that is an important factor in, in good politics. It's very enlightening, but also maybe ironic isn't the term for it, but with how the Soviet Union is, is normally presented, 
again, as like kind of a top down and you just have to follow it. There's no freedom under socialism or communism. But given these examples, there there's a freedom that, of course, operates differently than. Yeah. yeah. It's always such a, you know. Nuanced. It is nuanced, and it makes me think about what a narrow definition of freedom so many of us who have only lived under capitalism have. I'm sure you think about this all the time, but you know, you have the freedom to write what you want, say what you want, in theory, go where you want, but you don't have the freedom not to starve in the street, which people did have in their socialism. Homelessness was illegal and housing guaranteed. I found the concept of the socialization of domestic work you know, fascinating through cafeterias, laundries, childcare, clothes mending cooperatives. How are these programs in practice? It varied a ton over time and depending on location. So these tended to be most successful in big cities, which makes sense because there's high population density and less common in rural areas. They also tended to be more common and more accepted in in more industrialized countries. I think one indication of their of the ultimate success of this program is that people ended up taking them for granted. In sources I've read for my dissertation, I, I've read complaints about the quality of food in the cafeterias, so the steel factory that some women I'm writing about worked in. Like, oh, you know, it's, it's like a little bit stale. There's not much variety. Like, but to me, that shows that it, it became a, a very normal part of life. Not a complete silver bullet. People still cooked in their homes and stuff like, like the, the early Bolshevik vision basically saw people eating collectively and doing collective laundry and all of this completely. And you can see this in housing design. Like early Bolshevik apartment blocks didn't, a lot of them didn't have kitchens. Like the apartments didn't have kitchens in them because the idea was that take all your meals in the cafeteria. Over time, that changed, largely because many people like cooking. <laughs> it's like a fun, kind of satisfying thing for many people. Most workplaces did have like, a place to eat, a lot of schools and stuff like this. It ended up being part of the everyday life. Yeah, so from what I understand, uh, this was a response to, I guess, women's emancipation in general, of course, but to the double burden problem. Mm -hmm. Because women, for social reasons, I guess, were still believed to handle the, the domestic work. And so this was a way of alleviating that burden by making it communal. Yeah, exactly. This was the goal. And there was a, the reason that state planners cared about this. One was ideological that women should be able to participate fully in society and fully in the workplace without, as you, as you say, being weighed down too much by the double burden. But also part of it was, was strategic. So by the mid to late 1960s, the populations of pretty much every country in Eastern Europe and I think the, the Soviet Union were declining because women just simply didn't have enough time to have more children and care for them. And this was a big problem. State planners who needed a steady labor force. In some countries, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Hungary, there was a big push in the 60s and 70s to build more laundries, canteens, daycares in order to support women having more children. We discussed some of the retreats that occurred under Stalin, but it's in the period following his death in 1953, which is known as the golden era of women's rights in the Eastern Bloc countries. This was post-World War II. Why is that? Why was this period better for women in the Eastern Bloc than it was prior to that period? The socialist world expanded massively after World War II in that, like where I am right now in Prague, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe became socialist. Those countries were really industrialized in a way that the Soviet Union was not, especially East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. So they had much more robust infrastructure for implementing this program of women's emancipation. And they also really needed women in the workforce because although they were industrialized, they had just gone through the devastation of war. So there was a real urgency to incorporating women into public life. And there were also the resources to start to build the infrastructure necessary to do that. And then Stalin's death in 1953, of course, cleared the air for more reform and like the re-legalization of abortion was a big thing that happened then. So this is something that I think <laughs> keeps coming up in, in these different interviews that I'm doing is that understanding the you know material conditions of the Soviet Union and how it had emerged, various conflicts which saw tens of millions of people die, famines uh, as a result of these conflicts, 
internal conflicts as well. And the place where they started from in 1917, from what I understand, the development level of Russia was the same as Great Britain's was in the 1600s in terms of technological progress and infrastructure. So with that said, it makes a lot of sense that it's these the countries added after 1945 to the Eastern, the so-called Eastern Bloc were much more developed because they had various forms of capitalism before. I can go back to Marx again. He had the idea that you know, a successful form of socialism wouldn't emerge unless it emerged from an, a well-developed and advanced capitalism. Exactly. And this is, you know, people say that Soviet Union skipped that phase. They went straight from feudalism to socialism. It caused some problems, but it was very different in, in some place like Czechoslovakia. Of course, not all women are cis or heterosexual. From my research, it's clear that oppression of LGBTQ persons was pervasive in the Eastern Bloc societies, yet both legislative and socially, these marginalized groups were treated differently in some aspects than in Western capitalist countries. Can you address this? It is true that all of the things we've been talking about have been policies that understood women in a very specific and kind of narrow way, which is as straight and cis and as mothers and interested in reproduction, which of course is not the reality for everybody who identifies as a woman. On one level, these societies tended to ignore the existence of LGBTQ people, although not 100%. In Czechoslovakia, there was an institute for sexology that did monitor <laughs> queerness in a sense, but it was definitely not so much a part of public discourse. I actually have a friend who wrote in her dissertation about what we would call gender-affirming surgery and what they called sex change operations under socialism in Czechoslovakia, which were to some degree available actually in the 1970s and 80s, but it was mostly in a sense to get people to conform to a more acceptable gender presentation. It was a mixed bag. And, you know, as we discussed earlier about the absence of civil society, uh, there wasn't a gay rights movement comparable to what we are familiar with in North America and, and Western Europe. But there was also less interference in people's private lives, you could say, because of the absence of any sort of organized religion. Not a straightforward thing. That point about like non-interference, person's private lives or their, their sexuality is an interesting point because I feel like that's essentially the opposite of what happened in North America where people were very invested in people's sexualities, which I guess maybe is what spurred on specifically the, the gay rights movement in North America. Yeah, there's a good book called um, Cracks in the Iron Closet, and it's about like, the queer community in Russia in the 1990s, but also historical, like looking back at the, it's, it's journalistic, so looking back at the lives of like the friends of the author, written by American before 1991. Yeah, the picture that emerges is basically a rich and private world that that didn't have a lot to do with public politics. And I think this is this is true of late socialist everyday life in general. There's a lot written about the importance of the dacha, which is, is like the Russian word for cottage, basically. People would spend all of their time at these weekend cottages in the country just with their friends and, and their families and developing these really rich you know, personal lives, which is counterintuitive. Right? It's very counterintuitive. But yeah, this is, this is how people live. So so you're saying it wasn't like Animal Farm or 1984 <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. yeah. My, my seventh grade English teacher lied to me. Terrible. Yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad that there's such a narrow view of what socialism was. <laughs> I don't have the quote in front of me, but another interesting book is by Sherry Wolf. It's called Sexuality and Socialism. It covers the history of the various LGBTQ community groups within socialist countries in the 20th century. And there's a particularly interesting part of the book where she discusses post-revolutionary like enthusiasm after like, 1917, where women are, are marrying women, men are marrying men. And I think it, it does kind of say that essentially that it's like if a, if a woman married another woman, that one of the women had to be quote unquote masculine and that live like a man or whatever. There's still these gender constrictions, but at that early period, it seems like revolution was in the air and uh, everyone was uh, quite happy to live as had never been d done before in Europe. Yeah, that's cool. I haven't heard of that book. I'll check it out. 
A claim often made is that while state socialism formally emancipated women, it did not fundamentally attack patriarchy or gender roles. A research that you've also completed with uh, Kirsten Godsey challenges this notion through looking at publications discussing gender, uh, I believe it's a magazine, state published magazine. In what ways were gender roles challenged? How were men expected to change in the face of women's emancipation? For that article, we looked at official state women's magazines, many of which promoted men taking a more active role as fathers. They're <laughs> like, I mean, Kristen found some Bulgarian women's magazines that have like covers with men pushing baby strollers. There's one where there's like a guy knitting and stuff like this, taking on more traditionally feminine tasks. I found similar sources in Czechoslovakia from a similar time period. The degree to which this actually unfolded in people's real lives is a, is a mixed bag. But in some of the sources I found, there were a lot of letters to the editor from both men and women who were saying, basically, like, the most important thing to me and a partner is that we can respect each other. And so, like, I wouldn't expect my wife to do all of the taking care of the home because I want to respect her as an intellectual equal. So I will do some of it, too. So there, you know, contrary to the stereotype that nothing changed on the level of people's interpersonal relations, I think we can say that that something did, at least for some people, especially younger people. And these magazines were from the, the 70s? or The ones that I was looking at were from the late 60s. I think Kristen's were from the 70s. Can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like in the West, the idea that you know men should be taking on the same domestic duties as women is a 21st century thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong about this. No, I think you're right. Because I think about like my parents, and it's like, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen my dad like clean before, right? So it's like, <laughs> um, yeah, it definitely feels to me like like something that is only really being attempted by like people my age. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like our generation. In your article, What Has Socialism Done for Women? The article that you know we brought up a couple of times through this talk, you compare countries that had a shared history until they were split, providing a perfect comparison between a capitalist and a socialist nation. And those countries were Austria and Hungary. How did these different political economies impact the livelihoods of women? And what do they tell us about those political economies? We chose to do this comparison between Austria and Hungary rather than between an explicit comparison between the United States and the Soviet Union, because there is accurate criticism that the U.S. and the Soviet Union had such different backgrounds, such different starting conditions, that there's really no fair way to do a, an apples-to-apples comparison. Austria and Hungary were the dual capitals of the Austro-Hungarian Empire until the First World War, and were neighbors and had very similar cultural and legal conditions. Basically, the timeline of and women's rights was much earlier in Hungary. So access to abortion, uh, participation in the workforce, all of these things that we've been discussing really happened in the 1950s in Hungary and not until the 1970s in Austria. A big thing that sociologist named Eva Fodor, who wrote a book on women's employment, comparing it in Austria and in Hungary. And the way she puts it is that in Hungary, women faced less discrimination in the workplace because they were women, because there was not a market economy. Employers <laughs> didn't really have the right to reject applicants in the same way. So there was just a much more successful incorporation of women into the workforce. And a big one that was interesting to me was that in Hungary, under socialism, it was much more common to send children to daycare, which is not surprising, as we've been discussing, but it's still true to this day. So that's the real legacy of, of the socialist period. There's still way more kids who go to kindergarten and daycare in Hungary than in, in Austria, and in Eastern Europe generally than in Western Europe. In regards to women being uh, discriminated in the workplace, the point you're making is that because there's no profit incentive, there is no reason for an employer to reject women to discriminate based on the fact that they can go on a maternity leave or they, they may get pregnant at some point. That's exactly what I was trying to get at. It's a big and persistent problem in capitalist countries that women won't be hired because there's a real or perceived fear on by employers that they'll quit or take time off for maternity leave. But under state socialism, the state would supply another worker if, if a woman on maternity leave. So it wasn't, yeah, there wasn't a problem that was in the same way.
the incentive to discriminate against women for their reproductive role. In the article, you highlight a rare, accurate depiction of communist women in the 1950s in the TV show called The Midwife. Called The Midwife, yeah, it's a British television show. Never watched, seen it on Netflix, but never clicked on it. <laughs> but I might watch that episode, though, because it sounds interesting. So essentially, this episode takes place in the 1950s. An au pair comes to live with a British family, and she's from Hungary. And uh, I'll, I'll let you explain it, because <laughs> you wrote about it. This is one of my favorite TV shows. It's basically an advertisement for the National Health Service in Britain. If you're excited about, although you're Canadian, yeah. so you, you've got a little bit more in, in terms of healthcare than I do. But anyways, the story is that this young Hungarian woman is hired by a British family in the 1950s to take care of their children. She gets pregnant and she goes, the father of this family is a doctor. And she says, I'm pregnant. Where do I go to get my abortion? And he is aghast because abortion in Britain at that time was completely illegal. People who provided abortions were, could be, and were sent to prison. She tries to induce an abortion in herself and almost dies. It's really upsetting. It goes back. And then she, in shame, is sent back home to Hungary. It's a really touching episode television-wise, because I think a lot of people don't know that abortion was legal in the Eastern Bloc far before it was in, in the West. Furthermore, this young woman is depicted as like, fun, <laughs> as, yeah, as, as lively and attractive, I guess, if that matters. But it, it is a kind of direct inversion of the stereotype, the Cold War stereotype of socialist women that we were discussing earlier. It's contrary to that stereotype, and it's an accurate portrayal, which you know rarely gets seen on TV, I think, of that period, regardless of whether they're communist men or, or communist women. There's also like the, the idea, I think a character in the episode states something like, this isn't a communist country, why would we have abortion? and how this ties into the whole like destruction of the nuclear family and a whole ton of other scary things that emerge from communism. Whether it's anti-racism or, you know, women being treated equally, access to abortion, it seems like there's a connection to all those things. Definitely. I mean, it was in the 50s. And what I think that episode shows is that the fact that communist states permitted abortion was evidence in the West of their moral corruption. And now many people acknowledge that abortion is a social good. So we just forget that it was allowed under communism because communism is supposed to be so evil, you know? So there's there's a real selective memory. The fall of the Soviet Union was by and large a calamity for many people, but how did it impact women overall? Has there been a retreat in women's rights? Uh, were there also any remnants of state socialism that exists in those countries, which I think you touched on already? There are some remnants. One is the general acceptance of of daycare and socialized child care. Another is long maternity leaves. Where I am in the Czech Republic, maternity leaves are three years. You can take up to three years. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's jaw-dropping. And it guarantees, I think the first year, it's 75% of your salary and then less in subsequent years. So it's not 100%, but it is stunning, especially for me as an American. And your job's protected. I know it's dismal in America in terms of maternity leave. In Canada, what it is, it's you can uh, take off one year and you get 55% of your salary. Alternatively, you can take one and a half years and have 55% of your salary spread out during that period as well. So yeah, that 75%, at least for that first year, I think you said it was for that three period is amazing. That's like far and away out of most countries, I think. That actually helps me understand the context, knowing what it's like in Canada. Because 55%, especially if you're not making much in the first place, is not enough with all of the expenses, of, especially of having a new child. That is one lasting impact. But overall, a lot of the state supports women went away in the 90s. There was something that didn't really exist under socialism was advertisements. So that meant in the 90s, there was kind of an explosion of advertisement in Eastern Europe and Russia. And a lot of it was stuff that we're, I think we probably both were really used to seeing our whole lives, just hyper-sexualized images of women used to sell like beer and cigarettes and whatever else. But that was a, like a brand new thing to a lot of people who had grown up under socialism. That catalyzed the first post-socialist feminist movement. <laughs> And just the, the kind of extreme sexualization of women. There's also a rise in sex work, you know, because there is 
such extreme poverty and the sex work under exploitative conditions. So that was and remains a pretty serious issue. One positive legacy for women from state socialism was the norm of studying in, in technical fields and a lot of white collar fields. So the, the gender breakdown of employment under socialism is actually very interesting. Fields like medicine, law, programming, what we would probably consider white collar fields were heavily feminized, like really, really dominated by women in fields like mining, steel work, heavy factory work, like very physical work. That was all super dominated by men and it was paid more. So miners earned a lot more than doctors, for example. So it's, it's kind of unintuitive to me. But the, the fact that women had training in all of these fields that are really important to the information economy meant that some women anyways had a, a head start ahead of men in terms of adapting to the post-socialist economy. Do you know of any, because I know the life expectancy of men dropped by like seven years during that period, did something similar happen to women? You know, it didn't. The life expectancy has been, I, I dug into this recently actually because it's relevant to my research, plummeted in the 90s in the Soviet Union in particular, less so in Eastern Europe, and especially in places with a single industry. So in towns that were dominated either by like one steelworks or one mine, most of which were privatized and closed. If you disaggregate all of the factors, the reason why men were dying so much earlier in the 90s is because of alcoholism. It was a lot of it was liver failure, and a lot of it was death by suicide. So yeah, the factors that were a direct response to just absolute economic devastation, and there was kind of a norm against women drinking in Russia. Like there was just a much more of a, of a culture of men socially drinking. So I, I think that accounts for most of the discrepancy in, in life expectancy. For my last few interviews, I feel like they've all ended on the most depressing note ever. I think two of them so far, it's like climate change is going to get us and there's nothing we can do. Um, but we can end this on, on, a, on a positive note. We've spent this hour or so uh, discussing the experience of women in, in state socialist countries. And as you've kind of already alluded to, even though socialism is no longer operating in these countries. Women there still benefit in different ways from institutional and state support during during that era. So for example, quoting from your article, What Has Socialism Done for Women? You state that six of the top 10 countries with the highest percentage of female doctors were on the other side of the Iron Curtain, so Eastern uh, European countries. Uh, for example, three-fourths of all the doctors in Estonia are women, compared to one-third of all doctors in the United States. UNESCO has a report which states that there are higher, much higher percentages of women working in the fields of scientific and research and development in Eastern Europe. Interesting factoid, which kind of shocked me, uh, two-thirds of judges in Russia were women. Despite the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the issues that have occurred since then, there's, I guess, something to be learned here that, as figured out by 19th century socialist feminists, that there is a benefit to state intervention, and hopefully all of our countries can move towards that. Did you have any kind of parting words that you wanted to, to provide? That's a wonderful note to end on. And that the, the state can and should act on behalf of women's emancipation. And that's really the way to do it, I think. And it's actionable. This is something that we can push for now. We know it's possible, and we know that countries with substantially less resources than uh, the United States or Canada were able to do it. So there's very, there's very few, uh, there's no good reasons uh, to not at this point. Yeah, amen. I'd like to say uh, thank you so much, Julia, for joining me. I'm sure all of our listeners will learn and have a place to start researching more. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a great pleasure. To read What Has Socialism Ever Done for Women and find further information regarding Julia's work and what we covered today, you can check out the freely accessible Patreon posting of this episode at patreon.com slash AES podcast.